Sam Shoemaker wrote a poem, I Stand by the Door. I liken this poem to being the church. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which men walk when they find God. There's no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside. And they, as much as I, crave to know where the door is. And all that so many ever find is only the wall where a door ought to be. They creep along the wall like blind men with outstretched groping hands, feeling for a door, knowing there must be a door. Yet they never find it. So I, I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is for men to find that door, the door that leads to God. The most important thing any man can do is to take hold of one of those blind groping hands and put it on the latch, the latch that only clicks and opens to the man's own hand. Men die outside that door as starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter. They die for want of what is within their grasp. They live on the other side of that door. They live to find it. Nothing else matters compared to helping them find the door and open it and walk in it and find him. So I stand by the door. Go in, go in, great saints, go all the way in. Go way down into the cavernous cellars and way up into the spacious attics, into the vast roomy house, this house where God is. Go into the deepest of hidden casements of withdrawal, of silence, of sainthood. Some must inhabit those inner rooms and know the depths and the heights of God and then call outside to the rest of us how wonderful it is inside. Sometimes I take a deeper look in. Sometimes I venture a little farther in, but my place seems to be a little closer to the opening. So I stand by the door. The people too far in do not see how near some are to leaving. Those too far in seem preoccupied with the wonder of it all. Somebody must watch for those who have just entered the door but would like to run away. So for them too, I stand by the door. I admire the people who go way in, but I wish, I wish they would not forget how it was before they got in. Then they would be able to help the people who have not even found the door or the people who want to run away again from God. You can go too deeply in, and you can stay too long, and you can forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know he is there, but not so far from men as not to hear them. And remember, they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, billions of them. But more important for me, one of them. Two of them, ten of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch. So, I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I had rather be a doorkeeper. So, I stand by the door.
Greetings and welcome to the Friday Morning Nameless. I'm Chad the Alcoholic. Kind of changing it to Chad the Girl Dad, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, probably what could possibly be the greatest show that ever happened on YouTube or the internet ever. I'm not saying it's going to be. I'm just saying it's quite possibly. <laughs> it, you never know. I mean, who knows how these things work. Um uh, I want to uh, say, everybody, say hello to Tayo. And this is Tayo. Hi, Tayo. And, uh, and to our very special guest, Elizabeth. It's down here. I don't. I feel like I need some sort of like WrestleMania yeah. <laughs> entry thing happening. <laughs> well, that's a good first question. What would be your en your entrance song at WrestleMania? What would mm. you pick? Um, I think a little salsa, maybe. <laughs> nice. I'd say uh, Cartwood, but I can't do them. Hmm. That I kind of wish I. I mean, I do have all sorts of fun branding I could play right now, and just we could get some music going. But we're not going to do it. I personally like the one feeding the ducks. That's kind of my favorite streamyard thing. Um, so, welcome, uh, welcome, Elizabeth. To, I feel like this is kind of. I'm going to do this because I feel kind of weird there here we'll do that there we go Didn't i knew tyler would be like don't do it don't do it <laughs> <laughs> um okay well welcome to uh to the friday morning nameless i want to thank you very much for taking the time to uh out of your day to join us and um i i find the work that you're doing fascinating i've i've read no, i didn't actually read because i don't actually read i mean i know how to read i just don't have the time to read and when mm -hmm. i do i i just kind of like to take naps so but i listen to it on audiobooks and i have a whole journey involved uh on well let's just say i thought i was a terrible student growing up which i kind of was and I, and I didn't have like all of my interests were very self-centered i i was very much into like playing guitar getting laid and getting drunk and i only did one of those things really well and that was getting drunk and and then i ended up like having this whole change in my life and uh eventually that led me to, to um like good and interesting ideas and god and so um i that that's how i've encountered your book through this this whole strange medium this incredible weird gift that we have called the internet that uh i don't know so welcome uh a little nervous because um i'm not starstruck that's not it i just don't have any great questions and but i do want to say hello to you and get to know you you as well as we can on here and i guess i know this is really cheeky but i guess i'll ask you because this is the question that you often ask is what is sacred what do you find to be sacred thank you chad and i'm looking forward to getting to know you too there's no need to be nervous um i i think everything is about relationship and I play with some of these words you know in the book I use connection relationship they all feel too um abstract to really get at what I'm grasping towards um love is probably the best one but similarly it has so many associations with it um the it starts from what I think life is and what a human being is and it's irreconcilably interdependent right that we are enmeshed we are born out of the relationship at the heart of god that the trinity is this amazing dance that creatively overflows and that we are made by god and we are made for each other and we are made by each other and so the connections between the relationships between me and my own soul which is always a work in progress me and other people me increasingly and the and the creation i want to be paying more attention to that relationship and yes me and love divine 
that's where that's what I want to protect. That's what I want to focus on. That's what I want to grow into and towards. Um, and I think that was very congruent with my kind of Christian tradition as a kind of thing at the heart of all good theology. Mm -hmm. Very, very, that's great. So yeah, you basically bring up something Tyler and I have talked lots about, which is um, re relational ontology. Although I'm not exactly sure I understand the word ontology yet, but I mean, it makes sense from, at least from my, from my frame, um, and then, and then, like, there's a stack of it. Just kind of like this, un, un, this unfurling of like, uh, of of re relationality, um, and uh, that which brings me to a, a really strange idea called um, a cosmological burrito. That uh, <laughs> and that's kind of like that. It's like you, like the and, and actually, I was thinking about, I was having a, I was at. Uh, after the meeting last night, some friends of, I, uh, of mine and I, we, we've been trying out different restaurants to hang out uh, after the meeting. And we, we, we went to Buffalo Wild Wings of all places, which, you know, I've been avoiding for like months and months. And we went there and it's like, yeah, but dude, you can get like six wings and then get six wings free. And it's like, whoa. So we were there and, um, uh, and, um, the the uh, the cosmological burrito idea of like everything is connected to everything is connected <laughs> to everything. You know, it's like you can't. And I was, anyways, I was talking with somebody there last night, and um, <clears throat> one of the topics yeah, came up. Chad, of, yes, can you, I, I just want you to flesh out the cosmological burrito a little bit more. Explain it fully, and then go back to the story. I will get there in one moment. The idea that. Okay, I'll tell you what the cosmological burrito is. It's, it's that uh, in the burrito you have you have you have the the rice, the beans, you have the tortilla, you have all of these different ingredients, right? And, and you know, and we have such this incredible gift where we can just kind of, you know, we we could go to the taco truck if you want, and you can order the burrito or you can make it. And oftentimes we get these things and we don't think of where they came from, and like this tremendous incredible gift that you have of. You could just like have a burrito if you're lucky enough to have one and just enjoy that right but you don't think that oh yeah well you know like what about the guy on the truck who's making the burrito you know what is his family life like and what was his whole entire life and existence like right you don't think about that you don't think about um that um or what his parents entire lives were you don't think about the the tires on the truck itself and where they came from mm. and how you know it in some somebody somewhere mined you know um, gravel so that the factory that could be built so that the tires can be made and you don't mm. think about the workers who built the factory you don't know, think about all of that's yeah. wrapped up in a burrito you know and it goes all the way back as you said to the to 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 the father you know and and you just don't think about that but we have all these tremendous luxuries and we just kind of walk around with our head in the clouds yeah. and just like, um, it's so easy to be ungrateful. Um, and, and yet if, if you, if we have the opportunities and oftentimes these opportunities for myself have only come through tremendous, uh, pain and hitting walls where I'm able to actually recognize the beauty of the burrito, you know, it's, and I know it's ridiculous, but it's I not, it's beautiful. It. And uh, so I was talking last night with the, with some of the folks and I was thinking of one of the most um, probably what seems probably to be one of the more, the more destructive forces in the world is the, the, the proclivity towards individualism, you know, and, and like, and it's easy to do that because and there's all sorts of factors out there that are pressing against me that want me to look out for me. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm grow, grow up in a, in a ideal like that. And, and, you know, so that, that's the opposite of, that's just me eating the burrito and think I'm the creator of the burrito. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. I purchased it. Uh, my identity as a consumer, I, I'm entitled to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, create I, I think a huge amount about formation and it's just a fancy word of who we're becoming but it it's 
in sort of the Christian tradition, it's who we're becoming quite deliberately on the assumption that our circumstances and our world and our culture and the media we consume will be forming us. And that is mainly, you know, unintentional and passive, but we can be intentional and active in seeking to be formed by the good, essentially that what we can choose, what we pay attention to, what stories we immerse ourselves in kind of ritually and collectively. And that's essentially what church is. Um, and also who we're in relationships with and the, the kind of my journey of trying to have this intuitive sense of, I think this thing is sacred. I think this is some deep truth about the universe that I want to live into is sort of taking me further and further to seeing that, that ambient background individualism and how easy it is just to assent to it and to make decisions based on that framework. And uh, it's, it takes a huge amount of energy to go, I don't believe that. I don't believe in individuals. Actually, I think it's a lie. I think we are persons in relationship. We are so interconnected that we are miserable and we cannot flourish when we're working on the logic of I am this isolated, rational consumer in the world, so slowly self actualizing through all my free choices. It's just bullshit. It's just not true. Um, and so I think things like moving into living in community, being part of a congregation, even when it's hard and annoying, <laughs> you know, my marriage, my children, my friendships, those things as wanting to remember that those, that's what lasts. That's what people will hopefully talk about at my funeral and everything else is just like earning a living. Fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, just quick, quickly, and I want to hear a little from Tyler. The, um, if you were, I've tried this before because actually one of my, one of my online friends, Jacob here brought up the idea about the, the individual is, uh, it's, it's a lie. And that's the first time I ever heard that. And I was like, wait, what? And, but when you really start to, as you, as you just laid out perfectly, I mean, yeah, that's, and, but if you ever really want to like, kind of like, uh, have people who are not only not only strangers, but even some of your friends look at you like you have lobsters coming out of your face. Just tell them that there's no such thing as an individual. Yeah. And they'll be like, what? Yeah. And, so, and that's how, like, like you said, this background thing is so loud <clears throat> and, and relevant that it's going to take probably the, yeah, the rest of my life to, to really, you know, really embody that the individual is a lie, you know, yeah. and it's yeah. quite an offensive uh, uh proposition if especially if you in, in the in the cult, culture that we've grown up that i've grown up in i don't i don't know about the, you guys but yeah i mean be the best you can be the army in the army of one all this yeah crap and yeah. uh you know yeah it i mean it's different different ages need different things right i think what i find helpful about my theological anthropology is is it is holds together a, a soul, right? A, a person. I think I am a person and that mm -hmm. persons exist and that I have a particular relationship with divine love, that I am not part of an amorphous mass. And I think cultures can swing in between communitarian to the point where the end of this, I'm avoiding the language where, where the, the person, the, the dignity and the beauty of a particular person is completely, um, elided and hidden and you know when you find that in uh totalitarian regimes of all kinds but also in just like mm, it's where cults end up right this like demand for the erosion of the distinctiveness and the particularity of persons mm -hmm. um and there have been times and centuries and i'm sure cultures even now where that I think is beginning to tip into something unhealthy. Mm. We've just gone so radically the other way <laughs> that we need that slightly shocking. There's no such thing as an individual thing to remind us of our interdependence and our interconnectedness. And I was talking the other day about, you probably know more about this than me because I've been on John Favaki's show and, and, and enjoyed him, but I don't know loads of his work, but I know that him and other psychologists are talking a lot about 4E co cognition mm -hmm. and this idea of the, like the mind is ex extended it's embodied, you know, it's not just happening behind my eyes. It's that, that thought happens in your whole body that, and 
I don't know, I don't know the model that well, but I went looking to see if there was something in that was that was basically cognition is communal mm -hmm. because I I'm I'm so aware of how everything I think I think because I'm basing it on frameworks and stories and references from a billion other people, right? <laughs> from a billion other books, from people I've been in conversation with, from my parents and that we mainly like what we believe what we think to be true is mainly about who do we trust that testimony is is test relational testimony is essentially how we come to decide what is true in the world because almost none of us are doing like original experiments in a lab in that very narrow scientific understanding of what truth is anyway <laughs> I, so i'm thinking about for cognition and like do they take seriously the, the deep the relationality of the way we decide things mm -hmm. Tell does any of that make any about, sense to you? <laughs> yes, I have, um, what that brings up to me is what I've heard John Bavicki talk about, which is distributed cognition. Mm. Uh, I think it's the idea. Paul van der Klee talks about sense making is a group project. Yes. That it's no individual can make sense by themselves of reality. Yeah. Uh, but it also uh, brings to mind your something I learned from you. I don't know if it's if you come up with it, but PLM? Almost definitely not. No, uh, this is what I mean. Everything is, we're all just part of an ongoing conversation, right? Um, people like me syndrome um, is what John Yates uses as the helpful shorthand for homophily. So, um, and he taught me homophily and homophily is uh, love of the same. F filio, love, homo, same. Um, so the, the the deep human preference for people like ourselves and this is as far as i know from john yates very constant it's not something that only bad people have right <laughs> we all feel drawn to people who remind us of ourselves in a way that's like embarrassing and a bit absurd and a bit ridiculous but when you start noticing it in yourself it's it's everywhere i had a woman on my podcast the other day who is a uh witch a medium that's not a group that i spend a lot of time with or know much about um and i went looking for someone from that tribe to talk to on my podcast and was like no 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 can't <laughs> see it can't find a way in can't i'm not drawn to a conversation with you and then i came across this woman and i was like okay you yeah i think i could talk to you and i got halfway through the interview and was like Oh, you're just you're reminding me of myself like this really embarrassing <laughs> thing like you're a tall brunette who's british and has a phd in catholic mystics like we <laughs> i felt safe talking to you because i have people like me syndrome and you know when people say they like our taste basically if you re if you read something and you go this is great it's probably because they're saying something you already think and if you meet someone and you think, I really like you, it's almost always something about them is reminding you of yourself. And that's just something that's really quite embarrassing to come to grips with, but has really unlocked a lot of how I understand the world now. I'm curious now, what was it about when you went searching for someone in the witch world to sort of connect with, <laughs> to put it that way, uh, what was it that you were looking for? And what was it that when you saw you like, oh, what was the framework you were working with? What's the definitely not speaking to you? And well, maybe I'll speak to you. How do you balance that? So I'm judgy, right? We're all, I hope. I not hope me. This is true. <laughs> and not, not just about, like, about, <laughs> about when you, when you don't know something, when you don't know someone and you, or you don't know a particular group or tribe or set of beliefs or whatever it is, we're, we're working with very partial two-dimensional models, right? We're working with the predictive processing thing. We're, we're working with a like sketch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so whenever I'm looking for a guest to help me understand a particular perspective. So the next thing I need is to go and find someone who is um, extremely sex positive because I've spoken to quite a lot of kind of more cautious people who are cautious about porn, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, so if I was going to look for them, mm. I think what I'm looking for is a mind at work who I can have a meaningful conversation with, who is capable of self-reflection, 
but also usually, and I'm only just coming to consciousness this, so, someone who I have something else in common with, because then you can, then you can Go build a bridge. bridge. You could, there's, there's some, there's a place to start in your common language. And I think what I felt initially, and it was because I don't, I didn't have anyone my, in my network who was a witch or medium, no one who I was initially already friends with. And I am friends with a very wide range of people because I don't find difference a problem in terms of having relationships, but I didn't have anyone. And so every time I came across someone online, it was looking at their Instagram profile, right? Or their personal website. And it was very corporate or it also had a symbolism that I just wasn't drawn to, or the aesthetics were putting me off. There's all these semi-conscious ridiculous judginesses that, that we have, which just like, Oh, it's not my preference. It's not reminding me of myself. Um, and this particular woman was wearing a great, floral suit I, like, I love a floral suit it's just it's as ridiculous and trivial as that you know mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah just looking well, for something in common and someone who i think i can have a meaningful conversation with i think that there's you know like i know we're calling it you know kind of like affectionately a syndrome but i do think that there is a lot of there, there's you know a lot of it i think is uh, uh that that plm is it's it's like uh it's it's a very much a part of of it's just being a human being a human right yeah and, and that's all that's a good thing and I, sorry i don't mean to do that because i know sometimes it's like well you know like you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater it's like yeah i mean you know like there's a reason why um i was attracted to to my you know to my wife and stuff like that and yeah, and, yeah. And I think it's some, very somebody else, you know. It's it's so the the way John Yates talks about it in Fractured, which is really helpful, is he compares it to our um seemingly hardwired desire for sweet things that most people have. And he, you know, he would say this is a kind of evolutionary thing. Sweets are high calorie and a sort of seeking thing for sugar. Is a really useful thing to have when you just need energy, right? When you're in dangerous situations or in famine. Uh, a, like preference for sweet things is not necessarily a problem. It just needs to be contained within structures. That means we're also getting other nutrition, right? <laughs> we're also getting plants. We're also getting grains. We're also getting protein, all these things. And he what healthy societies do is they create conditions in which you can both really enjoy desserts but not only eat desserts because that would be bad for you and he says what well, instead we've got particularly with sugar is an obesogenic society um where it's just repeatedly trying to use that tendency against us and i think the same is true with homophily or people like me we all, we all I, as far as i can tell the data shows no one is this is not just something that racists have this is not just something that you know and we all do have a preference for people like ourselves and it's quite useful to confess that and and mm -hmm. to normalize it in some ways and it can be totally fine in moderation right mm -hmm. most of us that like it's what has had friends come together it's how interest you know you, you have a choir who forms because you all love a particular type of music and that's a source of joy and it's nothing to be ashamed of but healthy societies mean we are also spending time with people not like us we are in shared institutions we have shared stories norms and values with people not like ourselves and we are constantly being reminded that the people who are not like us are not therefore evil enemies they are people that we have to live with and work with but unhealthy societies conflictogenic rothogenic societies not only remove all those safety mechanisms they then weaponize that tendency against us and are continually enforcing it so it's that p neutral in moderation, really dangerous when it gets out of control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. sorry, Chad. I think it's it's why um, I find your podcast, the Sacred Podcast, very interesting and uh, a must watch. It sits at, in this in between place. We started off with our talking about our important relationship, not just important, how essential it is for yeah. living. And then we moved on to our, our preference is to be in relationship with people like us. But that preference isn't our, our maybe. It's you, we need those relationships to be able mm -hmm. to exist. Now, there's a, there's a conflict or there's a 
negotiation taking place between how much of people like me and how much of people like me, people not like me do mm-hmm. I, uh, how do I negotiate those different relationships? And I don't know if there's like it's not like a clear formula of mm. like people like you to unlike you. It's mm. a constant dialogue that I watch you go through, especially at the end of every episode <laughs> of the Sacred Podcast. Uh, yeah. What is it about our society that isn't giving us a healthy balance of PLM and not PLM? Yeah. So you can look at this demographically and you can look at this in terms of our information environment. Um, the demographic forces get called the big sort. And there was a big study in the New York Times um, last week that just showed like the over the last, since the last US election, number of people that have moved house towards areas like the, 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 the mixed voter neighborhoods have gone down. That now when people are moving house, being amongst people who voted like them is slightly higher up their list of preferences, which is meaning that you're getting fewer mixed neighborhoods and more um, homogenous neighborhoods in terms of political preference. And that's that goes for all things. So socioeconomically, we're less likely to live near people who earn more or less money than us. Educationally, we're less likely to go to school. Um, you know, in the mid 20th century in the UK, there was there was far less of this sorting. There were still people who were richer and people who were poorer, you know, people who were temperamentally conservative or traditional and people who were temperamentally liberal or progressive. It's just that they would be institution in institutions with each other. They would live on the same street as each other. They would be in the same shops as each other, right? The, the sort of frictionless uh, online world means we're just physically in the same space as other people less, right? You're not even going into your workplace as often and being forced to sit alongside people not like you. So over the course of the last century, our actual physical contact with people not like us has just gone right down. When you combine that with the the information environment changes and what you see um, with the internet and then hugely with social media and then most key with algorithmic, algorithmically driven social media is you get the same thing happening in the online space as you do in the offline space. And so we're being walled off from each other. We do not have the same story. We do not have the same values. And it is really terrifying the effect that it's had on our ability to tolerate each other. My tradition calls us to love your neighbor, right? We don't even know our neighbors. And it doesn't just say love your neighbor, it says love your enemy. But the idea that anyone could love their enemy in this environment is, um, it sounds really absurd and it sounds unrighteous because the righteous thing to do is to realize that they're the bad guys and keep yourself pure and away from them and pour contempt on them. And that's what moral goodness is coded as now. Um, so I spend, I spend some time, I, sp- I deliberately have to spend some time with people like me, right? We live in a small intentional community. We're not that diverse. We came together around a very common set of values and mission and we love each other up close in our lives and that's okay right we are we're trying to be family to each other um but then i'm part of a congregation that has a real mixture of people on all kinds of different um i hate all these measures and labels and boxes but it's it's a very 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 mixed congregation and that's really uncomfortable sometimes and really good for me and then the sake the sacred is this practice of forcing myself into long form conversations where I'm listening deeply and seeking to understand guests that I would not naturally have chosen (laughs) to spend an hour in conversation with if I was just following my preferences. And you're right, the bit at the end is this editorial high wire wire act where I'm trying to be honest and normalize this without dishonoring the guest or making them feel like they're, they're on false pretenses or that I in any way I'm not respecting their dignity and their particularity and their value. Yeah, there uh, are, <clears throat> um, I was, uh, my brain has stopped working. Sorry, one second. <laughs> it's all good. Um, the, what, what you kind of, what you're kind of reminding me of is, 
um I think that's why like uh the, the organization uh why the, or why the 12 step model works so well because it kind of like you have a common peril you know and that kind of pulls you together yeah. but you have like the most ridiculous uh uh kind of like um buckshot uh set of personalities all over the place and it's like I, I would not hang out with this person at all. You know, but, um, but you know, like I have, uh, I'm, I'm well acquainted with my own shortcomings and um, the looming threat of death if I don't adhere to a higher standard or, let's say, a higher principle. And so then you just kind of like, uh, like I, I think the most extreme way of like explaining this principle would be like, you know, if, if, if. Uh, if, if Jeffrey Dahmer or or some or or Hitler or somebody walked into the room and said, "I'm suffering from alcoholism. I need to change. Will you help me?" And you're like the the principle is you say, "Well, screw your ideas, Chad." And yeah. Say yes, I'm willing to help you, and yeah. then you actually do it. You know, or you try to take the action forward towards it, and you know, obviously, like. And, and you also you don't get to take credit for it you know yeah. that's kind of the, the yeah. that that principle and i've seen that work so well that um and what i find interesting is that um people in our in our society um and what i find really interesting is that i don't think christians all christians as a whole as like let's say the body don't really understand that their life actually depends on this principle hmm. like the alcoholic understands it because if they don't do it then they drink and to drink is to die blah 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 but like the, the 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 person who claims to be this is why i was so terrified of being christian because i like my experience w was was it didn't show me that those people would mm. actually be like that and so like i've taken it upon myself now as that that's what it means to be a christian and my life actually depends on um trying to do this it's very difficult though because it's easy to live service it mm. and you know like i can say this but i i even saw myself the other day i was in a live stream with somebody and also that's why i love these this the 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 community which i don't like that i think it's the i would rather call it the fellowship of uh this little corner of the internet you have all these different personalities and stuff we get to talk and we get to we get to share ideas we get to sometimes it's really contentious um but i was in a live stream the other day with somebody that i really respected and that I, and then he mentioned something that i completely disagreed with and i could not understand him mm. and uh and i immediately went to i can't talk to this person ever again like that's where i went to and i'm yeah. like and i don't want to feel that way but i can't yeah. help myself from feeling that way and what is that you know how do yeah. i get past that yeah yeah and it's it's such a natural reaction and i think the homophily people like me thing really helped me because if so much of my preferences for people is based on similarity then when they reveal themselves to not be me <laughs> to not be fully in agreement with me then there's some this almost feels like existential threat right there's this like whoa false false pretenses <laughs> you know what what would it mean about me if we're in relationship when you think that right ha, ha, and it's why i find the kind of theological call to have our identity deeply rooted in this primary relationship really helpful and then to be both aware of my people like me and trying to resist it because it means I can, you know, like this conversation I had recently with Rodrea, who I have shed loads in common with, like loads and loads and loads, more than I thought until I started reading his most recent book. Lots of ways we think really, really, really simul similarly. <laughs> and then we've got some key areas of quite deep difference that I was more aware of, right? And the tension of holding those and being like, you don't have to resolve it. You don't have to put someone into enemy friend. You can just put someone into human who is deserving of your 
respect and your attention and your love because that is what my scriptures tell me that like love your neighbor and does not put a boundary on who those neighbors are that's the whole point of the good samaritan story mm. it's not who you think it's not just the people like it's a, it whoever whoever crosses your path is your neighbor and you are called to love them and to serve them and i am slowly learning that i can totally be friends with people who trigger me like that guy triggered you I can mm -hmm. totally go, oh, oh, that is not what I think about that at all. Mm -hmm. But there's this point of connection here. And I might we might actually learn from each other if we can hold the tension of that difference. We might actually come to understand each other's position in a way that's very life-giving for us both and challenges all of our two-dimensional prejudices and models and misunderstandings of each other. And something incredibly beautiful can come out of that. But it requires us tolerating the fight or flight that gets kicked up mm -hmm. and letting that wear off and move through us. Yeah. The, the fear, fear is a tremendous, uh, 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 driver. It has, it has so much leverage. Yeah. And, and yeah. And like, oftentimes I'm not even necessarily aware of those things. Cause like what this person said was something that I would have totally agreed with, like, let's say five years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have had no problem. I would, I would have been like, yeah, no, I'm right there with you. And so I don't know if that was too something like, am I? Now I'm questioning myself. Yeah. Is there something wrong with me? Yeah. Have I become one of those weird Christian people now? You know, like that's yeah. that's terrifying to me. Um, <clears throat> and I can't help but think of like in this whole conversation, the, the great divorce mm -hmm. is coming to mind. You know, this idea of uh that the, the i think it's called the gray city or something where you just keep moving further and further out and yeah and and isolating yourselves further and further out there or yeah um you know and and actually one of the things that kind of drew me to the 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 this internet space initially was something that Vanderclay talked about which was um he noticed that the that the church at that point and now that was like five six seven years ago he was talking about it being so insular mm -hmm. and that, and, and I was so drawn to that idea. Cause like, I saw that he wasn't being that. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a, I think the, the solution to the, 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 one of the, the answers to the problem is, is uh, that relational ontology, you mm -hmm. know, like, but it takes a lot of stretching and like, that's where I find grace really is is where i'll allow myself to be stretched you know mm. and uh yeah yeah it's a that's beautiful and i think you're absolutely right that cs that cs's lewis vision of hell mm -hmm. is us being able to tolerate fewer and fewer people like moving out into the distant mists to avoid contact with people because people are hard work mm -hmm. and and that whatever turning towards love and turning towards heaven is is a you know, it, it is it is is being prepared to be challenged and irritated, and stretched by other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know the the getting the getting thing, it's uh, that's why I I also learned this too in the in the rooms of AA was like eventually because I there's a certain point in my recovery I was thinking you know they're all talking about being happy and they're all like happy and bubbly and they're always saying they're grateful for everything part of my language. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, and it's like, I don't feel what they're feeling. And then I thought, um, you know, like, well, if I screw these guys, I'm not going to be at this meeting because they're all ridiculous and they got all these whatever sensibilities that I can't stand. So I'm going to go to the next group. And like, eventually, like, you'll hear like the best way to, or, you know, all you need to start a meeting is a resentment in a coffee pot, you know, and it's like, that's bullshit. You know, and because what you realize is like there's no meeting on the planet will provide me what I'm looking for. Yeah. Because there's not enough of it. Yeah. You know, what I learned is what there is, what there's an unlimited supply of is what can you bring? Yeah. So it's the, it's the, the bringing, not the getting, yeah. the giving, not the getting. And yeah. which that can sound like a really horrible idea to some people because they think, well, who's going to take care of me? Yeah. You know, um, Tyler, I think you had something. Yeah, there were there were a few things that were running through my mind. Um, it's the push and the pull because now I'm thinking about the 
Okay, let me frame it this way. There's this conversation going on. Paul van der Klee, Jonathan Peugeot, and Viveki recently had a conversation titled The Advent of the Sacred. And there's a... I've got a feeling that I don't know how likely you would have been able to be friends with someone if they were attacking something that's sacred to you. Mm. And it seems part of the symptom of the advent of the sacred is that everyone's holding, finding more and more sacred things, mm. which could lead to um, a wider and, and reach and expanding your horizon, or it could lead to you uh, being very protective of this new sacred thing that you found that you don't want it attacked. Mm -hmm. I think there's wisdom in that because thinking in the context of a church, uh, if the church doesn't have the sacred thing that it's all done to, it stops being a church. It's just, there's what are we even meeting for? Um, mm -hmm. If we're not all into this truth and protecting this truth. Mm -hmm. And that I think that tension it can often we can it can be too easy to say yeah sure open up and you know welcome in the NPLMs, mm. uh, but there is a threshold where you stop being you when there are more NPLMs and PLMs mm. in this sort of community. It's so interesting. I mean, I think pointing to the recovery movement is probably helpful here because it has structures, right? It has things that you, if you're gonna join, you have to listen to other people, you need to shut up, <laughs> you need to, this is all from reading. Um, you know, th th there's a book, there, is a, there, 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 are, there are some things that are required of you if you're gonna be fully part of this community, right? And nobody so will make you. Yeah, exactly, but it's a free choice and the barrier is actually really, really low and everyone is welcome. So it's not an it's not an it's not identity based, right? It is choice. It is what you're going to orient yourself to, and it's sort of radically inclusive in that way. In a way that I think is one of the most beautiful demonstrations of a sort of gospel outworking that I know of. And in some ways, the church is the same. It you're so welcome to come and be, but this is what we're going to be doing, right? We're going to be praying. We're going to be singing. We're going to be reading the Bible. And whoever you are, you are so welcome to join us. But this is what we do here. Like these are the outlines of our community. And it's really about what are we attending to? Where is our attention focused? And so I think that instinct that we don't want to get diluted is totally understandable, but one to be avoided because it's not about numbers it's about where's the attention focused and there's this helpful thing that i've never been able to really track down in sociology but it showed up in a lot of sermons and i think one person said it in one sociological book book <laughs> once and then loads of people used it in sermons which sometimes happen which is about uh, a sort of border bounded set and a, a, a center focused set in terms of real communities like that i hope the church can and should be are held together by the focus on the center, which for me is Jesus. And some people are quite far back, right? But they're not excluded. They're just on the edges, but it's 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 the proximity to the center, which is the sort of defining force of gravity, which requires you to be quite relaxed about things being messy on the edges. A border boundary set is really, there is a very straight line. You are in or you are, you are out. You know, you have this identity or you don't have this identity. And those are appropriate in some ways, but I think we should we should res we should be pretty careful about using them as sort of essentially for theological and relational reasons, because people's trust grows slowly over time, often through being allowed to belong to something that they're not sure if there's a part of them yet. There's a classic thing, isn't there? Recovery that people can come to a bunch of meetings and just sit in the back and listen and not engage before they get up the courage to sort of come over the boundary. So I would always wanted to be saying, what, it, what is the maximal hospitality we can hold and keep our attention on the thing that we wanna be forming us? And th there are edges to that, right? Like we have a lot of hospitality in our Christian intentional community, but we also have a very rigorous routine of morning prayer, evening prayer, we have this we have we have the kind of monastic practices to <coughs> excuse me 
It's very unpleasant. Apologies. <coughs> They're not like us. Oh. Shows you that line again. Okay, I paused that. It. Sorry. I, I, no, yeah, I paused it. I didn't pause it early enough. <laughs> Got a little bit of coughing. Sorry. Yeah. The sort of end of my sentence yeah. is that having those strong structures of attention allow us mm -hmm. to hold really quite wide hospitality without feeling like we're just becoming a sort of mush with no identity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that, uh, well, I, like you already, you already kind of said, the commandment of love God uh, and then love your neighbor and then love your enemy. All, all that, that's a, that, that's that primary purpose. It's kind of like a, this strange trinity uh, of focus. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, yeah. I also, the, it's, it's, the other thing it's making yeah. me think of, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but your question is an no, excellent I love it. one. And I think the other thing it's making me think of is, there's something particular about the Christian story, which re I think almost requires us not to defend it, that the path of the path of faith is a, a surrender, a surrender of power and a surrender of control. And so the idea that we could defend, pardon me, we could speak up for and we can share about but the something about the cross and the the way there's actual there's actually power in turning the other cheek right there's a, there's power in non-retaliation there's power in being the underdog outsider and that mustard seed that critical yeast and so a lot of the sort of christian identitarian stuff that i'm hearing a lot of it shows up in Christian nationalism just feels to me to be like a weird inversion of what I actually see in the New Testament in terms of the posture we're supposed to have to wider society. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, yeah, and a lot of that too, I think it, it's again, <clears throat> it's born out of the, the fears, you know, like, cause like when you were mentioning um, like uh, the, the, the 12 step model is based on choice. Like there's no, there's, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but I was thinking, yeah, but no, there's one thing that brings us together. It's this common ailment. Yeah. Right. So and like you're forced you know, into it, right. Almost. Right. Yeah. And like, but like, um, like, let's say like a gambler, right. I, I say I'm alcoholic and I'm at an AA meeting and, um, you know, you're not just going to have some random or let's just say a random violinist come in and just hang out. You know, it's like, well, and, and they're not alcoholic. They don't identify as such. And mm. and so there is identity does bring us together. Now, there is no rule there where we where we kick them out. Mm. But we could say, you know, like uh, this is a closed meeting. Um, and, you know, it makes sense. If you're not an alcoholic, it doesn't make sense for you to be here. Yeah, we, we can ask them to leave. Yeah. Um, for the privacy of people but like yeah. so i'm thinking about the, the what the point is is like um to to stay keep the attention focused on the primary purpose that that's is what keeps the thing together and yeah and so traditions and things like that are very important and then when that when those things start to get poked at that's when people who really love something can become fearful and then want yeah. to protect it yeah. so christian nationalism and stuff and i mean the first church i was i was baptized at and stuff like i got i felt compelled to get baptized and i did and it was wonderful and but right away i could see there was something weird about it you know and mm. you know and i i i, I don't think i'm i'm temperamental i'm temperamental mentally uh, more progressive and liberal right um but i would say in the like in a voting booth situation i'm going to I have historically voted more conservative, politically conservative, but mm -hmm. I'm not temperamentally that, you hmm. know what I mean? I'm mm. just not. And, but so like I'm in this church and I can tell that kind of the spirit there was this kind of politically conservative thing, which makes me uncomfortable 
in church because I don't know, like, I don't know if that's for my formation in the 12 step model because in, in the 12 step model, we don't have any opinions on that sort of thing. Yeah, there, like, <clears throat> those kinds of things are like, no, yeah. we don't talk about that here. Yeah, uh, but you know, like, and I had to leave because I it just was like, no, nah, I'm not interested in that. I can get m so much of that out there in the yeah, world. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that goes both ways, right? And it's a particular problem in the States. But, you know, I had a friend who was like, oh, I left my church after I heard the third sermon on gun control, right? It's just like when when politics becomes the sacred frame mm -hmm. and everything else is subservient to it, something's gone wrong. Yeah, totally. Um, well, one of the things that I really think is, is sacred is, is I think, uh, like... Because I've thought about the question, you know, I like that you asked the question because it gets me thinking about what do I think it actually is? And then not only what do I think it is, but even maybe more importantly, how have I been acting out what I think it is? Yeah. And what so do, what do you think it is for you? I, I think it I think that it it's it's a continual I think metanoia is sacred. <laughs> a continual um willingness to repent is i think that for me has to be because i just know how how self-centered i am mm. and i need that if if that isn't kind of like the kind of driving principle then i don't get to be in relationship with other people so mm. i i do like i'm very i'm very tempted to, to say that your answer that's a that's a um, uh, a great ideal for me to because I do think that that is there's something to that probably it's probably true but I don't think I can have that without a constant mm. um, commitment to to towards repentance. Wow. And and the, but the thing is is I hate repentance. Oh yeah. Until I do it, you know. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, yeah. You know, and like the cuz I'm constantly living up here with this person. Yeah. Who who um is is uh uh well acquainted with his in, uh, insufficiencies and his own opinions. And like there's a whole like Paul Vanderclay calls it the consciousness congress and man there's like a whole bunch of these bastards up here. You know? And they just yes. like no, no, no. Yes. Yes. No. No. And it's like it's it, it, and it's um, it's a lot. It's a lot. And 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 sometimes I think though, I have to be willing to, I have to be willing to submit to the idea of repentance. I'm not sure if I've ever um, willfully actually repented, but I know I've definitely. I, I know I've definitely been been um, crawled towards uh, crawled on my knees towards repentance um, because I needed it so desperately and yeah. I couldn't stand to be in a certain way anymore. You know what I mean? So like, you could say that's a choice, but I'm not sure it's a choice because like, yeah, it's it's like it's like being in a, a burning building. Yeah, and you're on like the 80th floor. Or something and you can't get down the stairs well, what do you do do you yeah. stay there and burn or do you do you jump out of an act of desperation you know and maybe i live if i hit the ground you know like that's uh that's repentance wow and uh that's hard it's hard not to be too bubbly on this but yeah no that's very powerful and challenging and I'm going to go away and spend some time searching myself. <laughs> Taya, what's sacred to you? There's no top in there. <laughs> uh, um, I think different members of my consciousness, consciousness Congress nominate different <laughs> things to be sacred at different times. Uh, one of them wants to say beauty, but I think ultimately, uh, the poets, the musicians, I'd be right. Love is at the center of it all. Mm. 
I know that word has been super diluted to the point where it's almost meaningless, but I... I've we haven't given... come up with a good alternative. I, I think on, under that, then uh, a lot of the other things that my Consciousness Congress members are speaking up as sacred, I think love captures them all. Yeah. What's your necklace? Uh, it's uh, something I picked up from the St. Paul's <laughs> uh, Catholic bookshop. It's Christ on a cross. It's beautiful. Thank you. Chad, my friend, you are amazing. I'm so, so, so grateful that uh, I got to be a part of this. There's that felt like an answer that you would read from one of those saints in the desert of this oh, why it's constantly repent and repent and repent. And I don't think that I don't think we can overstate the our need for repentance. And one of the one of the things I'm very I was born into Christendom uh, I and then I gave my life to Christ and I've been trying to make sense of what that means ever since because Christians comes in all different ways and sizes and with different ideas. I think one of the benefits of having the, uh, the AA to Christianity pipeline is what you've <laughs> <laughs> what you've just um, exempted, you're reminding us of the need to constantly remember that you are, we are dependent on God in every moment for the breath that we breathe. And that's a, that a, attention, attending back to that, I think uh, is a good way to, to stay on, to stay on the path. Mm. Another thing I've, um, that makes this Christian things complicated is I going back to what we were saying about fear of the bounded sets, the fear that can the fear being a motivation for being a bounded set community. I think I've seen um and I've I'm friends with many people who fear is not their motivation, it's love. Mm. Uh, that makes them super protective. Mm. I think of people that would say something like justice being sacred to them. Mm. There's a and I think it seems to me that God gives us all of these different uh, lenses to make different things more obvious to us for the sake of a healthy community. <laughs> and if we cast away the, um, I see them as they could be trolls on night, uh, think like a gargoyle at the edge of a church, or think a uh, knight going from the center into the outside to you for the sake of protecting the mm their community. And I think there are many people like that. And I'm, I think mainly of the apologetic scene. That's mm. those are very much the knights slash trolls of the faith in my experience that really want to defend it. And they will yeah. they've all sorts of arguments that um, really never convinces anyone most of the mm. time in my experience, but it does serve as a this isn't a nothing thing. And I want to honor those people with those roles. I don't, mm. I'm far more of a, oh, everyone come in, come in. But if if I had it my way, then I would invite everyone, including the devil, to come. To mm. come to. Maybe uh, maybe that's why I, I am listening to all of this universalist. But anyway, that's besides the point. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I think there is a need for the knights at the edge and the yeah. trolls at the edge of the of the city. Mm. If we just cast them away as being fearful and um, make them change, I don't think that would be healthy for a community either. Yeah. I, what learning about people like me, syndrome or whatever you want to call it, homophily, has done is made me realise how much we want to universalize our preferences and our particular calling and actually there's so much wisdom in what you said because a healthy community requires diversity of gifts and of callings and the kind of picture of the church as a body is so helpful and so challenging because it's like the foot can't say to the eye I don't need you and I don't 
and you find it even in organizations right in workplaces like the in my in my, in my world the research team don't really value the work of the comms team or historically the comms team don't really value the work of the research team because they're like clearly the important thing is the research or clearly the important thing is the comms or clearly the important thing is the fundraising or clearly the important thing is the sales or whatever it is that we are interested and are good at that's what we think is important for everybody and the humility to go exactly as you've said I don't like, understand, or I'm particularly interested in that. But it doesn't mean we don't need it. It's one of the hardest things to grow up into because of this sense, you know, ourself is the center of the universe. I was thinking about the, okay, so like the idea of the, the, the individual is a lie, right? But then there's like wrapped up in that is like the, the, the diverse, there's something deeply true about um uh, the idea of, of 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 diversity like the burrito it's like it's not just beans you know what i mean it's like everything in there but i was thinking about um i can't remember there's something i think it might have been something that you were talking about with roger maybe it was in your book i was listening to but uh, something came to mind when I, um what do you think about about this idea about um well, I'll just share my own experience. Every time I've been um, had the, the the moments of of uh, that I've had in life where I've actually uh, embodied a, a gratitude, where it was like like a, like a pouring on me, like whoa, like wow, you know what I mean? Like that yeah. has always been surprised. So like surprised by love, and then like the way that um, that I I used to hear people talking about um higher powers or god was something like it was like just like this really kind of like laissez-faire real simple it's just like simple you can just get it or it's like this bubbly thing without teeth for lack of a better word you know and <clears throat> and i think and then my experience with actually um becoming christian was uh very much against my will I wasn't looking for that. It was, I feel, I describe it as being captured by Christ. And there was like, that was a surprise. Hmm. Right. And then, or when, uh, when I, when I, I remember the moment I first seen my wife, that's very weird because I don't remember I often remember moments where I first meet somebody, but I still remember the first moment. And it was a completely mundane moment that I remember. I remember exactly, uh, like I still, I can play it in my mind, all that stuff. There's a surprise there too, and so this idea that God doesn't necessarily capitulate, but He captures, and there's a surprise by that. And so, if we can um, uh, kind of like be open to the surprise, mm. be, you know, and and uh, that's that's this um, that 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 can only be afforded by diverse um landscape a, a diverse arena mm. um and so yeah and and that's life and and in life is a stack of things it's not like one thing it's not you know that's what it's not the individual thing it's like all of that and mm. and you could see this if i think if people actually really sit and examine kind of their life and look at all of the look at your timeline and look at um, all of the different iterations of life that you've had, the highs, the lows, all of it. And then you just really look at it. And, but look at it once through a frame of gratitude once, and you'll be surprised that even the most horrible moments are like some of the the, the most necessary. Mm -hmm. And that's that diverse stack called life. Um, and, yeah, I was talking with with Anne, my wife, the other day, because she she mentioned that her her brother in law's uh, family member um, had passed away. He had you know three daughters and a wife, and he was like in his uh, uh, mid thirties, and he had got unexpectedly ill, and just and it took him quick. And I was thinking about, and I could see it was worrying my wife because she's pregnant, and we're having our first child, and you know wow. all of this whole thing thank you all this whole thing is weird right so like being a homeowner being a husband and and like that was not in the stack that i saw 
life was going to be. And then, it, and then it's like surprise, and it's like, what? And but I was, I could see that this the story that she was telling me was concerning her because she was looking at like, wow, what if that happens to Chad? And and I had to just kind of like, and I was getting ready to leave to head off to a meeting or whatever. And I before I I, I said, you know. I was just tell, trying to to tell her and comfort her and let her know, like, you know, if I do, on like, let's just say on my way to this meeting, I, whatever, get in an accident and I die or something, just know that this has been the most incredible life. And I don't, you know, I don't know, I'm, what I'm trying to uh, say here, I'm, I know I'm kind of blah, 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 blah. Keep what I'm trying to say is, like, give yourself time to to examine those moments examine things tell people like actually tell them like how you feel <laughs> like you know like in in because it's so easy just be like i love you give a peck on the, you know give a little mm -hmm. kiss and then you're out and, oh that's normal and stuff like that but that's why i like what you've talked about in your book and, and practices are so huge you know like intentional attention Point pointing your attention intentionally in in a direction that um, that allows for that diverse landscape to unflourish and and become greater than you can imagine. Like that's good stuff and uh, and difficult. Yeah, yeah. Discipline does not come easy to me. It's like a long, slow thing of realizing how much I need this trellis. Right? I need I need help. That's why the metanoia thing is so important, and I'm very, I'm going to go away very inspired and challenged by you because I probably don't center it enough. But again and again, just the humility, which again I struggle with, to go, I am distractible and fragile and self-oriented and short-tempered and a bit of a mess, and I believe that there is love that is calling me into more right that, that because i am loved i don't have to earn it but that there's something to grow up into there's more freedom there's more joy there's more capacity to love other people and that when we're all growing towards that everything is better right there's more life um but without the con without immersing ourselves in the story without going to meetings or doing the prayers or whatever it is it's really easy to forget. It just slides out of focus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, one of the there's a book that uh, my sponsor suggests. He's like early on in sobriety, kind of like, well, I'm always neurotic. So, but then I always have like a, you know, like oh, I don't feel good, so I must be doing something wrong. Feeling, mm -hmm. you know, which is just. Uh, but he suggested there's this book if you ever get a chance. It's called uh, Spirituality of Imperfection. Mm. Storytelling and the Search for Meaning by Ernie Kearns. Great book. It's if you ever just if you're in if you're into having daily readers or something, that might yeah. be a cool one to check out. Wonderful. Um I'm yeah. afraid I need to um head off into the rest of my day. Which Perfect. It's a shame because I have loved speaking to you too very much and I'm very grateful for you making well, the time. Thank you for spending time with us over here and um all the work that you're doing is great and I appreciate it very much. And thank you, Tyle, for coming. And uh yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. All Hope right. To speak to you again at some point. Bye, everybody. Well, I don't know about the meaning crisis left, right. Black, white, or other vices Which Jesus Christ is right Or if we're all saved From my perspective Our propositions Participate procedurally Running in circles And we're in body We're in the age of decay Symbolically speaking the reapers are reaping, them damn egregores are whispering sweetly. We're all NPCs in the belly of the beast. 
Red pill, blue pill, bread pill, Mars Hill, or DMT, or whatever you feel. Got one and number two, it's all the same damn thing. So clean your room, repent on Zoom, ontology for dummies, a bird's eye view. Cause if you really knew, could you really even say? Totally depraved, all totally saved A total disposition from the bed we all made Or is it the elect? Or are we just insane? From John Verbeke to Jonathan Pajot And Jordan Peterson to the Chris Pacu Show Paul Vander Clays and Griswold Grimm and all the dice he shakes. The sestuary ditty is a little bit cringy and quite the youth shaped or the hero's journey. All the NPCs in the flood dread and water to watch you save the day with a bunch of chitter chatter. From the Ortho Bros. To the Catholic Joes, or atheistic Joes, to Protestant folks, the Joe Schmoes, and Jewish Jacobs, and everything in between. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind, and your fingers and toes, all your neighbors too. As if they were your own So love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul And with all your mind and your fingers and toes All your neighbors too As if they were your own Thank you.